Ladies and gents, welcome back to another Engineers podcast. Uh, today, we've got Sahel Patil, who's a staff engineer at the one and only Monzo Bank, who've done some incredible things over the last few years. And for all of our UK listeners, you should know about these guys and girls. Today, we're going to talk about two really prevalent topics in software engineering space recently in platform engineering and developer tooling. And we're going to break those down into some subsections and where Monzo were a number of years ago and where they are today. So stay tuned for the next 30, 40 minutes and, and listen to what Monzo are doing. But Sahel, hi, how are you? Hello, uh, great, to, great to be on the, on the podcast. Uh, and yeah, as uh, Elliot has mentioned, uh, my name is Sahel, uh, and I work as a uh, as an engineer at Monzo within the uh, platform group. I've been with Monzo for over four years now, which seems like an absolute lifetime, but uh, in in startup years. Uh, but we're really just getting started. Uh, developer productivity is a very very huge area for for Monzo, uh, and we've gone through quite a few different iterations uh, of developer productivity. Uh, and yeah, I'm really excited to talk about. Uh, some of those aspects uh, today, what has worked really well for us, uh, what has worked not so well, um, and ha you know uh, what tools we use in, in the trade and what things that we, we aspire to. Yeah, that would be great. Can you intro for all of our non-UK listeners who might not know who Monzo are, just who Monzo are? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Monzo is an online-only uh, bank. Uh, we are a fully licensed and regulated bank here within the United Kingdom. We have over 6 million customers uh, that use Monzo on a, on a very daily basis. We have these really nice hot coral cards as well, which are like a, like a you know orangey pink uh, hue, uh, which uh, you may see about, uh, especially in your, in your travels. Um, and the general premise is uh, a bank that you enjoy banking with. Uh, so, you know, we provide an app uh, like like most uh, banks do but uh, because everything is online only we strive to make sure to give you the absolute best customer experience uh, so we care very very deeply about our our app and uh, what you what you see uh, as a bank as a as a as a product, a product you enjoy using, uh, you know, a product, a product that we continuously iterate on and improve and polish um, to the point where you actually enjoy opening the Monzo application, understanding how you are using your money. Ultimately, we want to be the financial control center for uh, all of your monetary needs. So whether you bank with us as a primary bank or whether you use us as like a, a, a personal account or a spending card or, or whatever, we want to be at the center of your of your financial focus uh, on a on a day-to-day -day basis um, and we believe a core part of that is providing the best in class integrations with uh, with uh, different banking providers uh, but also different third parties to help you be in control of your money this isn't an ad at all by the way for everyone listening but it's a game changer I, i've even got my mum banking properly and clearly with monzo it's it's an unbelievable product, unbelievable product. Uh, talk to us about where you started at Monzo four years ago and the nature of platform engineering and developer tooling. And then it'd be great to hear where we are today. And then we'll start talking about some of those subsections. Yeah, absolutely. So four years ago... Uh Monzo was really quite lucky in in the way that it uh, started off with its technologies, and a lot of those technologies have uh, stood the test of time. But originally, when they were when they were picked, uh, you know, they were innovation tokens that we uh, that we had taken. So, for example, uh, one of the key choices and decisions that was made was uh, to focus on Kubernetes, for example. So originally, Monzo started on a on a Mesos cluster, um, and uh, unfortunately, Mesos is a is a bit of a relic of the past uh, since Kubernetes has, has taken over. Um, Kubernetes, for those who are not familiar, is like a container orchestration engine. So you can throw your workload at it and it will determine the best uh, host to run it on and manage things like uh, uptime and, and failure detection and health checks and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, Monzo took a really early bet uh, early on and there were a whole heap of teething problems 
Uh, and especially when you're trying to build a regulated bank, uh, you know, taking such a such a bold decision at the time, uh, you know, seemed like quite a risky one. But it has been one that has paid off massively in uh, uh, and, and stood the test of time. Uh, and you know, you look at Kubernetes and the whole like cloud native ecosystem now is a flourishing uh, ecosystem uh, with hundreds hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of of developers using those tools on a daily basis. But when we started, it was still a very small grassroots community where you'd go to a meetup and there'd be like, you know, the 30 original developers of Kubernetes uh, just sitting there, you know, hacking away on this on this uh, on this project. Um, so, yeah, it was quite early days. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of our internal tooling as well, uh, you know, showed uh, that level of maturity or actually, to put it better, immaturity. Uh, you know, engineers, for example, had access to things like Kubernetes and were able to deploy things onto Kubernetes in order to unblock themselves. You know, it's very much an early, like, startup, uh, you know, ecosystem where, you know, you want to ship and iterate fast. And, you know, we had some, you know, artisanal bash uh, or crafty bash, depending on, uh, you know, uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder. Um, yeah, like, you know, some some artisanal bash that would glue together and construct things like Kubernetes manifest and would allow you to deploy your, your services and, and systems. Another very early bet we, we made was uh, to embrace the world of microservices. Um, now, m many folks don't, don't quite realize, but getting a banking license takes a significant amount of time. Uh, and within that amount of time, you're pretty much left waiting in limbo. Uh, with the with the regulators, especially here in the UK, uh, so in that amount of time, uh, Monzo and a lot of its early engineers, um, and this this predates my time as well. A lot of the early engineers spent a significant amount of time, sort of polishing a really good framework for building microservices internally. So really, really good and solid and robust integrations, things that are well monitored, uh, well tested, uh, you know, a, a core foundation for microservices. Um, and we actually call this the bedrock uh, layer. Uh, and is built on some open source technologies that we have uh, open sourced. Um, and, you know, there have been plenty of other frameworks that have come out afterwards, uh, but this serves as our key foundational layer and still used to this day. Every single request you make through the Monzo, uh, Monzo app, uh, everything that you interact with, with Monzo, every time you make a card payment, every time we receive a payment from another bank, goes through the same foundational layer uh, that, that powers uh, all of our microservice ecosystem. So it's a unification of all of these different components. It's not just because we chose Kubernetes that we have been really, really productive. It's the, the mix of Kubernetes and the microservices ecosystem that we have that makes uh, organizational, uh, you know, uh, organizational units autonomous and independent, uh, plus the, the layer uh, that we have within our platform, which is these core libraries, these core foundations, things like the bedrock framework layer and our integrations with our like database systems and our queue systems uh, are all uh, built and molded so that engineers don't have to reinvent these things from scratch. The way I like to think about it is um, if you had like a, a box here, uh, you know, you have all of these like bedrock and, and foundational layers all sort of built for you. Uh, all of that is scaffolded for you um, and it's just there ready ready for you to consume. And you can just add your business logic on top. Um, the, the experience I like, to, uh, I like to draw similarities to is Heroku. Um, if you've used Heroku in the past, um, you know, Heroku, you'd essentially give it your application and it'd figure out how to run it and it'd provide you hooks and integrations uh, to hook into things like uh, Heroku Postgres and Heroku Redis and, and, and things like that. Uh, we provide a very, very similar experience, but one which is actually much more tailored to, to Monzo's uh, use case. Um, and over time, we've essentially uh, refined and refined and refined to make those uh, libraries and that foundational layer uh, much more secure, much more resilient, much more fault tolerant, much more observable as well, because in the world of, of distributed systems and microservices, things go wrong all of the time you yeah. know we serve like you know hundreds of thousands of requests per second uh in in uh, at any one time uh, you know building a bank is is really really complex and you need best in class tooling in order to to facilitate all of this and we've been able to continuously refine and build that ecosystem out within monzo uh, which has been one of the reasons why we've been able to scale to such a large number of microservices uh, we have over 2000 microservices in production and that yeah. number is continuously growing building that microservices ecosystem or 
using the scaffolding analogy is is fantastic to to understand it was it that deliberate back then you know we're we're going back four five plus years was it that deliberate that you would build an ecosystem where we are building a business develop developers can come in on board as seamlessly as possible and just start spinning up new services as easy as possible I would like to say that it was a relatively deliberate decision because if you look at a lot of the core foundations, they lend themselves uh, very nicely to this style of, of ecosystem. And so the, the, that kind of uh, those libraries and those frameworks don't come by accident. Uh, you know, there has to be some level of deliberation. Um, a lot of uh, us and a lot of the early engineers uh, at Monzo come from uh, various uh, companies like startup companies and also, uh, you know, big institutions where we've seen, uh, you know, the breakdown of, of like really large monolith applications and seeing that when these organizations scale, for example, uh, you get a significant loss in productivity because you're conflicting with a change that another engineer is working on and you need to coordinate release cycles and someone's got a broken build and, you know, it, 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 it's a whole mess. And I'm not saying the, the world of microservices it's, is its own utopia uh, and everything is solved within the microservice realm. But uh, for a company which has uh, and ha has had from the very beginning very strong ambitions of growing really, really quickly. Uh, yeah. You know, that also means that our headcount has also grown really, really quickly. And that means our organizational complexity has grown really, really quickly as well. So for us, uh, you know, it, it's allowed us to separate technical complexity and organizational complexity. Yeah. What we have is uh, each microservice is owned by a, a specific group and a microservice changes hands continuously uh, you know a microservice might change hand from from one team to another just at the at the flip of a switch um, you know for example you update some code owner files and and that that transfer is done uh, there was no strong coupling uh, between microservice uh, dependencies uh, a microservice is its own independent unit which hosts its own data layer uh, and can be independently scaled and independently deployed and independently managed and independently worked on. Uh, so the engineers are not trampling over each other and there isn't a conflict between engineers. There is a strong API contract, which is strictly defined. Um, and we use uh, Go as our, as our microservice uh, development language of choice uh, internally within Monzo. So things are all very strongly typed. Uh, and you know that makes for a very like you know a nice API surface uh, that is well documented. The, there's a lot of startup experience at Monzo that that you were describing, and uh, I think the replication of building that ecosystem has stood you in really good stead to be able to move fast. What would be your top tips for people if they were to build an ecosystem like this for the future, where you say can separate? the technical and business complexity, what would you say top tips would be to think about? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a really good question. So for me, I, I think that foundational layer is the, the most important part uh, because otherwise what you have is you have engineers sort of reinventing the wheel. Uh, and when you, when you get to a position where engineers are, really have a strong desire to use your tooling and not reinvent the wheel. That means they spend more time focusing on the on the business level problem. Um, and this uh, whole power of unification is really, really strong. So again, that foundational layer, if we, for example, find a bug or a vulnerability, or there's, an, uh, there's a, a, a new metric we want to add, or there's some better observability we want to add, all of these engineers get the benefits for free. Um, I remember a couple of years back, I made a, a quite a quite a large optimization to one of our database libraries to yep. make uh, marshalling and unmarshalling significantly faster. And you know, engineers just deployed their applications, and because of this strong API contract, they had to change zero lines of code in their application. And you could just see wow. their CPU graph tumble. Uh, and the amount of resources uh, that were being used for their applications uh, get significantly lower and their latencies get significantly better. So there's that economies of scale that you that you build up. Now, I, th I think there is a balance to strike because obviously when you are in a much smaller environment, you don't have a ton of time to build out the perfect foundational layer, but to build some sort of foundation is really, really important. It, you know, it's the same, uh, it's the same as like building uh, like a p place of residence or, or or, or something like that. That you know, no matter how grand your plans are, if you're building a mansion, you're gonna have really, really strong foundations. If you're building a house, you're gonna have 
you know, not foundations fit for a mansion. Uh, and if you're building a shack, you're still going to have some level of foundation so that you know, your shack doesn't just fall over. And I think that analogy does sort of carry through. Uh, it, like, you know, you want to build the foundations which are appropriate for your level of organization, but also can you know allow you to scale. It's also worth acknowledging, for example, when your foundations are falling down. You know, no foundations are going to be perfect from the get go. Uh, otherwise, you possibly have not focused on the business level problem as well. There is a balance to be struck. Um, you know, your foundations need to grow as your company grows, um, but that's a, a level of investment that needs to be continuously put in over time. Yeah. Is the investment into the ecosystem still being made now, as in still changes as the business changes? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can give you a very concrete example. Um, we've grown to over 200 engineers now, and yep. now we have multiple teams, especially within platform engineering, focusing on all aspects from uh, making sure that our platform is reliable and stable, to making sure that our database systems and libraries and frameworks are easy to use and, and uh, provide a reliable and consistent experience, but also another side focusing on uh, development, uh, continuous integration, and uh, continuous delivery of software. Um, you know, we have a whole bunch of engineers focusing on that because at that level of scale, if we can make uh, all, all the rest of the engineers more productive, ultimately, as an organization, we we win. Uh, so that level of investment needs to be continuously made. And that level of investment has continued to grow um, as, our, as our organization grows. I wouldn't want to say that it's uh, like, you know, there is some sort of like linear correlation um, mm. because ultimately yeah. the whole goal of a platform engineering team uh, you know, aside from uh, providing a better developer experience, is to also unlock economies of scale. Uh, you know, as you continue to grow to 400 engineers, it doesn't mean you need 10% of your of your organization focused on developer productivity. There, I think there is a there is an upper bar, uh, for example, where you've unlocked peak developer productivity uh, for your organization. Yeah, um, but it's a level of investment that we continue to put in. And uh, th I think we've been very fortunate uh, that the entire organization from the CEO, the CTO, um, and all the way down, uh, all of the VPs and engineering directors, they've seen this level of organization, uh, this level of, of investment in, in our developer tooling and developer engineering be an enabler rather than a detractor. So it's an area that they have continued to focus on and continued to, to put investment in, which is re which has been really, really good to see because uh, I fundamentally believe, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but you know, speaking to my peers as well, uh, you know, they've seen the, the leverage that it gives us as an organization. Yeah, it really feels like an enabling mentality as well. Exactly. L listening to this journey and another journey I'd love to touch on, there's, there's a couple of things in there that are in our subsections around automated testing, automated tooling and detection. But I want to focus on the CI and CD journey and Monzo's evolution of that, because I think there's an interesting story in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So for us, um, you know, CI and, and CD tooling is like something that we've uh, built in-house. Um, so for example, uh, with continuous integration, we spend a lot of time investing in uh, testing frameworks and static analysis and and a bunch of tooling around the, the point of writing code. Uh, so when you're writing code, uh, essentially, you know, a, a significant amount of engineering time is spent in reviewing code and, you know, making sure that uh, business problems are being solved for, but also uh, for engineers to catch logical problems. So for example, you've got a race condition here or you're not using a mutex correctly here, or for example, you know uh, something that would be quite detrimental for us is you've got a security vulnerability here where you're not doing appropriate authorization checks, um, and you know that's pretty low uh, low effort work. Uh, but you know if you miss it, then it leads to quite critical vulnerabilities. And uh, you know when you've got such a large number of engineers and a very large software state with uh, two thousand plus microservices, having an engineer be the blocker and say, okay, right, every single product request must go through the security team and the platform team and things like that becomes uh, you know quite a big tr uh, detractor um, you know essentially you're becoming akin to a change approval board uh, you know for anyone yeah. who's read the uh, DevOps handbook uh, you know that's exactly the kind of environment that it describes uh, and that's not something that we we really want to we really want to do. and it's also something that doesn't scale so the, the one of the key investments we make is in you know, code that can understand code, 
uh, and yep. you know things like static analysis tooling, uh, understanding what has been changed and how it's been changed and why it's been changed. Uh, you know the, the whole power of Unity means we can write quite limited tooling, uh, which is focused on one key area, uh, and we know that engineers are going to pick that uh, that uh, structure of developing their applications and we can build bespoke tooling uh, for those particular use cases and reduce the barrier to entry because the, the tooling can immediately tell you in a very objective way whether your code is correct or not. Uh, you know, you can't argue with the tooling. And we continue to make improvements and investments into that tooling. And as it continues to find more regressions, we learn from incidents, for example, uh, when yeah. things occur. And, you know, we, we continue to update our, our applications. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good tooling in the in the open ecosystem as well. Things like Snick, uh, for example, um, which is which is a product. Uh, but, um, you know, Datadog also have GuardDog as well, uh, which checks for vulnerabilities. You know, there's a lot of really good products in the ecosystem out there which are doing similar things to, to what we're doing and that you can pay a very small amount of money or pick from the open source community and and use and and utilize um, so uh, for us continuous integration is, is a key uh, you know that's one of the key parts within within continuous integration within delivery itself I think this is where we've been really fortunate with our choice of uh, tools like kubernetes and 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 things like that one of the key philosophies that we've had is that engineers shouldn't have to worry about the platform layer. You know, we've picked Kubernetes as a tool, but for example, if we decided tomorrow that we're going to pick Lambda as a tool, then you know that's something that we'd want to enable and support. Uh, but you know, engineers shouldn't have to be really familiar with that level of tooling. You know, um, many engineers like uh, writing and, and working with Kubernetes, but a very very large uh, group of engineers hate the whole concept of platform engineering like they just see it as like a barrier to entry a yep. very easy foot gun something that's easy to get wrong um and you know we want to have some level of consistency so one of the key things that we've done is we build automated tools uh, that sit within our platforms so these are services that look like any other microservice at Monzo that sit within our platform uh, that interact that engineers can interact with, and you can essentially orchestrate the deployment of your application. You tell it uh, using some CLI tools that we provide, um, and one of the key tools that we provide is a CLI tool called Shipper. And you tell it, um, for example, I want to deploy this artifact at this revision, and it will go and build the artifact in a clean environment, uh, and you know go through the entire life cycle of deploying it at the click of a button. And you know we continue to add functionality to that delivery tooling. So quite recently, we added uh, functionality to do automated rollbacks. So we have a very very strong monitoring culture here at Monzo. Um, every service is is monitored uh, right from the get go um, because of our foundational layer emitting all of these metrics. Um, so we're able to say, okay, you've just made a deployment and there has been a strong uptick in errors, for example, or there's been a deviation in, in, in bug reports, for example, and that piece of software can be automatically rolled back and we can notify the engineers that your code was running uh, for, for five minutes and we noticed an uptick in errors and therefore we chose to roll your software back uh, in order to not inconvenience our customers. Um, and so, you know, it, it's tools like that that we continue, it's, it's pieces of functionality that we continue to add. Now, uh, that automated rollbacks functionality that I that I described, uh, you know, is built on top of Kubernetes and we've used a system called Argo, um, uh, which uh, Argo yeah. CD, um, yeah. which is built on top of Kubernetes, but we've not exposed Argo CD to our engineers. And I think that's another conscious choice that we've made. Uh, what we've done is we've essentially wrapped it up within our own CLI tooling. So that, for example, if we chose to to run another style of platform or you know chose to use another subsystem to provide that same level of functionality engineers don't need to uh, like port all of their all of their applications over you know they they have no idea that they're running within the argo framework so if there's a new Great. tool that comes within the ecosystem a better tool a tool that is more fit for purpose or there's another integration we want to add we have that level of flexibility because engineers are not writing bespoke kubernetes yaml or bespoke argo uh, resource definitions and and things like that um, you know again uh, within this shipper tooling it automates the whole orchestration of Kubernetes manifests. Um, so you know, an engineer doesn't have to touch a single line of YAML. Is is the the goal that we that we really uh, strive for? Um, it's not currently the case. Um, you know, engineers do need to interact with manifests, but it's very very limited. Uh, and you know, we're looking to make that a, as small as a surface area as possible to the point where it just doesn't exist. 
it feels like an extremely deliberate, well thought out, methodical developer tooling process that you're going through, through CI, CD, you're making conscious decisions about what you're exposing engineers to and why every single step of the way as well. And we've moved from five years ago, probably longer, um, building this microservices ecosystem to really thinking about continuous integration and delivery and some of the decisions that we're making right before software goes into production. And by the way, that's probably constantly because 200 engineers releasing a number of times a day, it feels like everything is so, so well thought out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, uh, I don't like to paint it as a as a magical utopia where everything is absolutely perfect. It's something you that did paint it like that, by the way. <laughs> I'm joking. It, it, it's something that we continuously uh, strive to to improve. And for example, bugs do occur along the way, uh, you know, f uh, for sure. But uh, you know, a key part of building all of this tooling is that, for example, we can limit our security exposure uh, with these with these sorts of incidents. Uh, we can limit our like blast rate exposure when it comes to customer impact uh, for example uh, things like canary deployments and 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 uh, which is a, a recent functionality that we've uh, that we've rolled out to to our engineers it essentially helps limit the impact that customers see so even if you do have some chaotic environment that's happening internally and all the sirens are going off uh, you know from a customer's point of view you can be in your supermarket or withdrawing cash at the ATM or you know going out for dinner with your friends and not have your card uh, decline because ultimately as a customer and you know we're all customers as well there's a very very poor experience and you know uh, we're all very used to this uh, like idea of our bank not being reliable like I, I don't know how many times uh, like you know uh, your bank does this but like twice a year the, the the bank I originally used to bank with would send us a notification like you know during uh, time changes like your app will be unavailable between this time and this time uh, and you know we're, we're in 2022 uh, you know uh, clock changes should be uh, fairly synchronized uh, why does my my bank need to have multiple hours of downtime uh, in order to to change change all of their all of their systems back it just shouldn't be necessary uh, so you know as much as the the chaos uh, uh, you know uh, occurs inside we want to make sure that that chaos remains inside when it does occur um, and you know for example we don't get it perfect uh, you know we're very transparent about the incidents that we that we have uh, we believe that it serves as a, as a service to the community to talk about the failures that we have as yeah. long as our as, as much as our successes um, and when they do occur uh, we want to have a very strong culture of uh, learning from the incidents and then building appropriate tooling to make sure in an, an automated manner we don't have incidents of a similar nature. Yeah, I agree. I, I do agree with that point. The The thing that I found really interesting and we've we've spoken about the decision making in in some of this software, but I think that the change approval board, and you'll explain some of that and how it's automated and separating the objectivity versus the subjectivity of, of what we're asking people inside the business. Could you explain that to people and how you built that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, if you uh, let's dissect a change approval board, uh, you know that you'd have at a at a typical organization. Yeah. A change approval board typically comes about because you want to have some sort of barrier that that uh, you know tries to uh, limit some amount of exposure to some issue that has been seen in the past. So, for yeah. example, uh, historically there might have been a security vulnerability, and then someone mandates, okay, we will now have the CISO sign off on every change to make sure that that vulnerability doesn't occur. Um, uh, and or there might have been a scale issue, or for example, or like a piece of functionality that has broken broken the the core banking flow, for example. And you can see how these sort of change approval boards layer up as, for example, an organization has learnt things over time. Um, you know, if you think about the the journey of a baby, it is a trial by fire. 
uh, you know, you keep getting told no by your parents or like, you know, you, you run into an issue and like, okay, right, I should stay away from the fire, uh, you know, because the fire is hot. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like a trial by fire uh, that you sort of learn and build up uh, your, your mental model over time. And that uh, from an organizational perspective also compounds. Uh, and yeah. that's how you end up with change approval boards that require 14, 15, 20 steps uh, in, in order to, to release a, a piece of software. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, a lot of those decision, decisions have come about because a human has wanted to intervene in the loop to make sure that they are aware of a change that is, that is going out. Now, for us, our philosophy has been to invert that. Right, and instead having a human, uh, instead of having a human in the loop, we want to have an automated system in the loop because an automated system, ca- uh, you know, doesn't complain. It is available twenty four seven. You know, can make a decision in minutes and is very very objective. Um, so we want to have really really strong automated systems that can tell you at the at the snap of a finger uh, that you know a piece of software is being released. Uh, and you know, we have all of those controls that all the other banks have. You know, we're not compromising on any of the controls uh, that, that uh, other banks have. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit biased. I would argue that we go above and beyond, uh, you know, many, yeah. many other organizations in the thoroughness uh, of the controls that we have. We don't provide many opportunities for bypassing those controls. You know, you don't need to, you can't become friends with the automated system. Uh, you know, the automated system is very, very objective. Uh, it isn't just a please and a thank you or a chocolate box or, you know, a box of beers away uh, from, from getting you your, your approval. Um, yeah. But it also means that, for example, uh, we have now teams in the US and they're able to ship and deliver autonomously without having to wait for people in the UK, uh, especially because we are a UK heavy company uh, with most, most of our like, platform and security teams here in the UK. They don't need to wait for the UK folks to sit there and like uh, and, and approve their their pieces of software. Yeah. So for us, you know, it, we've been able to give that investment in in our tooling. Now, uh, to give to give credit and, and respect to some of the other organizations, um, you know, many of those organizations have built up multiple layers of technical complexity. Uh, so these changes uh, sometimes are really really hard to introduce. Um, so, for example, you know, if you're using multiple programming languages, you know, static ana- analysis tooling might not have feature parity across all of your programming languages, and therefore it's uh, easier uh, most of the time to put up a human barrier. Right? It's far easier to just staff one engine and say, okay, right, your full-time job is to be this technical barrier for all of these teams uh, because they're writing software in Java, Kotlin, Scala, Rust, Go, every single programming language under the sun uh, from the 60s onwards. Um, So, you know, I think it is is very much a a trade-off. For us, we've wanted to be really, really nimble. And a key part of why engineers like working at Monzo, you know, at Monzo, um, rather ironically, it's really easy to forget that you work within a bank or within a regulated environment because our rate of delivery, we deploy hundreds of times per day. uh, And our rate of delivery is just super, super fast and super, super productive, uh, you know, to the point where, it's a little bit too fast, um, but the thing is, the automated systems, and you know, we learn, we lean very, very heavily on our on our data, and we can see these changes going out, and we can see, for example, when cracks start to appear and when incidents are being caused, and then we go and remediate those things with tooling rather than with 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 human intervention. And and a really good example for that is uh, the automated rollback. Uh, stuff that we've uh, been been rolling out to our engineers, where we've hooked in very deeply with our monitoring systems, and you know we've been able to deploy this thing and mitigate a whole source of incidents that we've had in the past. What well, what would be your clear message to people on how you can emulate some of your speed inside of Monzo? What do people really need to go and do? Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually think uh, I think I can do one better, which is uh, <laughs> nowadays you can probably take a, a lot of shortcuts. Um, you know, there's a lot of really good tooling in the in the open source world uh, where engineers have tried to emulate uh, similar similar uh, systems. So, for example, similar st- scaffolding systems. Uh, you know, with tools like SEMgrep, you can get static analysis going really really quickly for a variety of programming languages. Uh, you know, with tools like Backstage, you can get a lot of uh, service discovery uh, up and running. With tools like Envoy, you can get um, Envoy the the Envoy proxy. You can get a very 
nice RPC layer uh, up and running. Uh, you know, a lot of those tools weren't there when we when we got started, and a lot of those tools are tools that we've now adopted because they have become far far superior. A lot of companies have invested their time and learnings into those pieces of software, and you know, some some companies may say that that adds a layer of complexity. You know, um, but then you actually look at their their infrastructure, and you know, it's uh, you know, a couple of folks, uh, you know, stringing together a bunch of bash scripts and, and things like that. And there's nothing, absolutely, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, what they don't realize is that that has a maintenance burden and a maintenance cost uh, and a knowledge silo and, and things like that. Whereas picking tools in the ecosystem with a lot of the engineers that we uh, hire now, um, a lot of those folks have had exposure to things like Kubernetes and, and uh, you know, a strong RPC and, and gRPC, for example, and, and tools like that. So, you know, we're we're on a, like a technical uh, f- uh, higher footing uh, as a result uh, because those engineers can become productive really, really quickly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, like you know, uh, I think the the clear message is look at what's happening in the open source ecosystem. Uh, yes. There's a significant amount of investment from companies like us, but also companies that are far larger than us, open sourcing their tooling uh, and and all of their learnings as well. Yeah. Uh, I'd double down on that point. Credit to Andrew Lawson for connecting us and getting us talking. We met over a coffee some time back, and that was one of his points, that engineers coming into the business, they will know tools, technologies in the ecosystem. He said, we can get people up to speed and getting into production in no time at all. And I think that is so much credit to the investment in a lot of the tooling, your microservices, scaffolding, framework, or ecosystem that you've built that people can just jump in and add value straight away. I always like to touch on this cross-training element or hiring element at the end, but we can talk about it now. Help us understand what Monzo might be hiring for or engineers that not engineers they typically look for, or how you calibrate engineers in an interview process. Give us some of that context. Yeah, absolutely. So because we've got this significant amount of investment in in our tooling, uh, and we've got a, a really good internal community that can help engineers get up and running, we actually don't look for any particular, for example, uh, we use a lot of Go, we don't look for any particular Go expertise or Kubernetes expertise or Terraform expertise. It's useful. Uh, like you know, if you're if you're joining, but it's not a requirement. Uh, it's not something that we that we look for uh, at all. Um, like you know, familiarity with our ecosystem. We have uh, folks who have come from a very traditional software background, writing you know enterprise Java applications, become extremely productive and and ship on on day one. Um, yeah. So yeah, like for us, our, our hiring practices, uh, you know, are really universal, uh, which also uh, works in our favor when it comes to diversity and inclusion, which is a very, very key uh, tenant of our of our hiring practices. Um, you know, a lot of uh, folks, especially in minority and ethnic groups, might have not had the opportunity to be exposed to those tools uh, right from the get go. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we provide a, a very strong environment for those folks to to level up and. Yeah, it really does uh, help us in in every respect uh, in our in our hiring uh, factors. Good. C- could you help us understand that the choice or the holistic choice and view of programming languages that help you structure software systems, anything else? We've touched on a lot, but it'd be great to just understand it in its entirety. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this might be a little bit uh, blasé for me to to say, but I essentially see the the program language as like a a a, t- a tool of choice, uh, but to v- reach an end result. Uh, you know, we write Go, um, but ultimately what we want to do is we want to serve our customers. Ultimately, we provide banking functionality. So, you know, uh, customers shouldn't need to care. Um, what we care about is, for example, providing a reliable and safe ecosystem so that customers don't have a degraded experience. Um, so for example, we handle a lot of concurrent code, uh, for example, um, and Go is really fantastic for that. Yeah. You know, if we had picked a language where we need to throw a lot more money at the problem, for example, like Python, I think is an absolutely fantastic language, uh, but it's not known for being very fast. 
uh, uh, you know, it requires a significant amount of resources uh, in order to run. So to emulate our software infrastructure in a program language called like, like Python uh, would be very, very expensive. Um, and, you know, when you look at other factors as well, like with, with uh, an, an infrastructure state that we run of our size, things like carbon footprint uh, and, you know, the amount of energy that we use uh, is something that we have to be very, very cognizant of uh, for, for, the software, for the software that we run. Being a responsible organization is a very key tenant for, for Monzo, being responsible to like our communities and to, to the global ecosystem. Um, so, you know, program language choice, ultimately, it is a tool to the, uh, to the end. You can, you can debate it to death, uh, yeah. you know, and ultimately, you do need to get started. Um, and, you know, we picked Go. It was a very good choice uh, at yeah. the time, and it's been a very stable choice. But ultimately, it is a means to an end. Uh, and we want to provide a product. Uh, and the product, uh, Go allows us to, to provide that product and to minimize, for example, like, you know, issues when it comes to, uh, you know, runtime safety and things like that, which are nice side benefits. But you can emulate a lot of those benefits afterwards. For example, you look at what um, Facebook has been doing with PHP um, or what Stripe has been doing with Ruby. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they, for example, have chosen a program language which they have been able to hire in and be very, very productive in. And instead, they've uh, made the value trade-off, and rightly so, that their engineers are really, really productive in their language in this particular language. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to build and, and open source in the ecosystem uh, tools to make that programming language better. Uh, you know, again, uh, focusing on, on Stripe, we have some of their work on Sorbet, which is like a type checking tool for, for Ruby. Um, you know, they must have an absolutely mammoth Ruby code base. Uh, and, you know, they have encountered these problems and open sourced a very, very useful tool that engineers can now pick up. So if you're now building a, a toy application, something where you want to get up and running really, really quickly and you don't need to have the complexity of Rust, you can take advantage of that ecosystem and still benefit, which is really, really great to see. Thank you. That's been really insightful. The, the last 40 minutes has been really insightful, in all honesty. And uh, I'm keen to see where you're going with you know, the next 200 engineers that join and how the ecosystem or the developer tooling or platform engineering landscape might change. Do, do you foresee, even over the next six, 12 months, where things might change or where you might develop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is... There is going to be continuous refinement. So one of the key areas that we're looking on within developer productivity is adding a lot more automation in the actual delivery of software. So for example, right now, an engineer triggers a deployment. And yep. whilst the whole deployment steps are all automated, essentially what we want to do is uh, you know, make it as simple as you click merge and your software is automatically being rolled out and, and deployed. And there's no technical barrier why we don't do that. It's mostly because engineers uh, you know, find it so easy to deploy that that system has worked really well for us. Yep. Um, so, you know, we've now got all of the infrastructure in place. We've got all the monitoring in place in order to make it, you know, so that an engineer has uh, been able to reduce one one additional step. Another area that I am uh, particularly keen to explore is uh, much more code generation. Um, we we automate a lot of the boilerplate that engineers uh, write uh, today. However, there's a uh, there's an entire area where we've seen, uh, you know, little bugs creeping through and, and, and things like that, that we want to make, uh, that we feel is, is an opportunity for us to, to automate away. Um, so we spend quite a lot of time templating code, code that writes code, uh, essentially. Um, one of the big problems with writing software is, you know, the sort of the blank cursor effect. When you open a file and it's an empty file and you don't know what to start with and we want to eliminate that. We want to be like, okay, right, I want to be productive really quickly. I, I have this concept in my head. I can describe the concept down. For example, I can describe my database uh, layer and it generates a whole bunch of glue code. And then you can decide, okay, right, this glue code is a good basis to start with, or yeah. I want to throw all of this away and start from scratch. But at least it provides a good initial starting point and inspiration to get started. Love it. I can't wait to see what happens over the next six, 12 months. What, what I do want to do in some of the notes anyway share some of your talks i think it's been a fascinating 45 minutes give or take on monzo's journey where you joined the business four years ago having that that ecosystem in place but just fascinating to see how methodical fast that the business is able to move and it's a product that i use 
on a day-to-day basis and and so many people use that I know so it's fascinating to see how you guys and girls do things and for people listening I think you've heard a, a phenomenal 45 minutes on how platform engineering and developer tooling can enable you to move so fast and if you are interested in the business what they're doing and want to get involved in some of what they're building you heard it here first that they are looking for engineers to join the business from all groups backgrounds and i think the cross training element is fantastic because you don't need to come in with any prerequisites on some of the tools technologies that we've spoken about already so get in touch with sahail there's links to careers sites that you can see in some of the notes but reach out, talk to the team, see what they're building and see how they're changing the game. And so, Hale, a massive thanks to to coming to join us and, and talk to us about some of what you're building. And Andrew, thanks for the recommendation. You know, it's been an awesome 45 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the for the time and opportunity. If I could make one small additional plug, uh, we run a very active uh, technology blog as well, uh, monzo.com slash blog, uh, which uh, is our company blog, where there's an entire technology uh, section. Uh, and yes, I think the links will be in the in the documentation afterwards, uh, where we talk about um, all of the successes and things that have been successful within within Monzo, especially within uh, developer experience and developer productivity, but also some of our learnings and some of our failures. So yeah, learn from our failures as well. Uh, it makes for very interesting reading uh, and I strongly recommend everyone checks it out. Yeah, we, we love failures as well. So that'll be really useful. And for people listening, like this, share this, show friends, show startups, show a founder, get people investing in it. And so, Hale, again, a big thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone listening. Cheers. Bye for now, all. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this episode. Uh, Massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io, it's no underscore. We've also got a website, which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.